Now this is a really interesting area. This is called HSG 48 and, and it looks at cause of human failure. Now I find this area very interesting because you can dig deeper here and find what they call latent failures and I'll come on to what that is in a minute. Which is, you know, but basically the things which are hidden, which have led to something else occurring. And sometimes when we're looking at risk assessments, we don't take these into consideration. So it's hugely important. I use this a lot in, when I'm doing reports and audits and expert witness stuff. And it is fundamentally brilliant, I think so anyway. So let me take you through the model. I mean, there's the model there. I'm going to take you through every bit, bit by bit. But you basically got on the left hand side their human failure. And that's when we say someone did something wrong. And it's normally left at that and we blame someone. Now, for those of you that know me a long time, I hate it when people are hung out to dry. I absolutely hate it. So when someone says, well, you, it was your fault, you didn't do it properly, I tend to look for the underpinning reasons why. And you can see it may be a, an error. So if we're looking along the top line there, it may be that that person made an error. Uh, but then we can define whether it's a skill based error or whether it was a mistake. Um, and then at the bottom, we look at violations, whether they're routine, situational, or exceptional. I'm going to go through each one of these in detail for you. And it is a fascinating subject, at least I think so anyway. Um, and this will help you a lot and set you apart from your competition when you're doing this stuff. So let's go through this bit by bit. First and foremost, let's define an error. Well, a human error, according to HFG 48, is an actual decision which was not intended which involved a deviation from an accepted standard and which led to an undesirable outcome. So in other words, someone did something and, and someone got harmed or there was an incident or an injury. Now, skill-based errors, there's two. There's slipses of action and lapses of memory. Now, these normally occur when we're doing something familiar, like driving a car. You know, you, so we're not paying conscious attention to it too much. So anywhere where staff have a routine, you know, that they're going through, where it just becomes the norm, and in our world here, we could look at lone working as a primary example, you know, particularly people who go out into the community late at night. It just becomes the accepted standard that that's the normal thing to do. And their awareness isn't there. They, you know, their, their situational awareness has actually dropped because they're used to this. Nothing's happened, you know, for years. Then all of a sudden, bang, you know, they, they become a victim of a potentially violent crime. And if we look at the case of Jenny Morrison, you know, that poor woman was stabbed to death by Anthony Joseph. And there's been other cases since. So that's what um, you know, a skill-based error is. We then have mistakes. And mistakes are when we do things wrong, believing it to be right. Now in our world, particularly you know, where we're talking about personal safety, use of force, self-defense, etc., this is where people give information that they, it's wrong. You know, it's wrong, but it's been handed to them by someone who's been, and they were handed by someone else. So it's become a repeated set of information. So that's one example. Well, let's look at this in more depth because it is fascinating. This is a rule-based mistake. Now, that's when someone makes up a rule. So in an organization somewhere, someone has made up a rule. And it could be because they're put in a position of authority. And as, 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 a, as a result of that job position, they're expected to know what they're talking about. Uh, and when they're asked for advice, they make up rules. Let me explore this further for you. Okay. It, it's where the rule exists, basically, generally speaking, in, in most cases, that has no basis in fact whatsoever. And I'll come on to an example of that in a minute. Now in short, they've simply been made up by someone without proper consultation or reference to, for example, any legal standard or understanding of the risks involved. And we get a lot of um, panels set up in the UK for certain things like restraint reduction panels and you know different panels for this and different panels for that. And they come up with, with, with stuff, okay? They come up with stuff that people who work the front line know won't work. Uh, but I'll get into this in a minute. For example, you may have an organizational training provider. You know, they may have a rule that says that a member of staff may not use a more restrictive intervention when controlling a violent person. Now, the ethics of that might be great, but when the non-restrictive technique is used and it fails and someone's injured, then you know, the member of staff may be blamed you know, for making a mistake by not doing the technique properly. So in other words, you know, where you've got this rule-based mistake, someone's made a rule saying you can't use a more restrictive technique, you can only use your non-harmful ones, and if you do them properly, it will all work fine. When the member of staff tries it and it fails, because it's a latent failure, and I'll come on to what that is in a minute, the member of staff is then blamed, which in itself self-justifies the rule that has no basis in fact. Are you with me so far? I hope I'm not confusing you. Now, these are this here, what I just spoke about, is a prime example of rule-based mistake. Now, as I mentioned, it's also called a latent failure. Now, a latent failure, uh, is something that causes a more direct failure. So for example, a technique not working. But let me show you the definition of a latent failure. That's what a latent failure is referred to. 
latent failures refer to less apparent failures in the design of organizational systems, the environment or equipment that are often hidden until they, until they contribute to the occurrence of errors or allow errors to go unrecognized until they harm someone. So in lots of training programs, there's lots of, of techniques, multi-move component techniques, you know, fine motor skill stuff, complex motor skill stuff, all great in the gym with no stress levels. But when they're expected to be used in a high level situation, they're going to fail because they've not looked at the knock on consequences of that. And that is an example of a latent failure. OK, let's go back to rule based mistakes. Now, now we know what a latent failure is. Now, another example of a rule based mistake or a latent failure that can lead to an error is when people in positions of influence use subjective opinion to come to a conclusion without any basis in fact. Any specific training in that area or any degree of operational competence in the subject matter they're commenting on. These people could include an organizational manager, an MBQ assessor, or a government inspector, any type of person in a position of influence that make comments or recommendations regarding the use of physical interventions, and I'm using that as an example, but it could be anything, when they themselves are not trained or do not have any operational competence in that area. Now I'll give you a real example of this. And she made a comment that any technique that involves the use of force with children that causes pain is illegal and I challenged that comment um, and she said no it's, it's true it's illegal but she has such a position of influence that even the prison governor sat to her left and her right both agreed with her but one of them worked in a young offenders institution where they used pain compliance techniques so it's a bit perverse really the long and short of the story was uh, I, I actually got a barrister involved and I got the barrister to actually comment on on her statement and he sent me the report and I have it if anyone wants to see it and basically, the words he used were, her comments were illegitimate. They had no basis in law. But that's a prime example where, you know, someone has made up a rule, but they're in a position of influence, so it influences others, and then it gets cascaded down, and that could be very, very dangerous indeed. Right, the next type of mistake is a knowledge-based mistake. And these typically occur when an individual has insufficient knowledge about how to perform a task. So let's look at these in a bit more depth as well. This is where organizations primarily rely on certain or specific individuals who are supposed to be experienced and or trained. So, you know, oh, so Joe's done this and Mary's done this and Sue's done this and Harry's done this and they're great and they've been doing it a long time and they know what they're talking about without any further qualification. So they're left to their own devices. And in some cases, these poor people are actually not supported and giving in any additional training or CPD. But what happens is that the information passed on by these individuals is sometimes relied upon too heavily and is rarely challenged, so it's not properly checked for accuracy. And in some cases, by the way, when you do challenge these people, they can be quite abrupt and they can be quite forceful in trying to re rebut your, your actual question, you know, because they don't know the answer, they try and make you look stupid for asking the question. One example of a knowledge-based mistake could be the trainer who used their authority to tell people things that they themselves have been told to pass on, possibly based on incompetent rules. So we have again this issue where they were trained by someone who was trained by someone who was trained by someone. Someone made up a, a rule. It got a not you know a rule. A, so it's a rule-based mistake. Got passed down to them. They accept that as knowledge without challenging it, and you now have a knowledge-based mistake that could occur. Sometimes the rules are even made up by people with with the experience and training, who may impose their authority on the people they are training, so that what they say isn't questioned. And we get that a lot. You know, a lot of trainers have a thing called the God, God complex. And if you look at Daniel Kahneman's work on this, he talks about the IKEA bias. You know, I made it, so it must be right. And the, because that person is in a position of influence, they're, they're seen as, as having what they call the halo effect or the halo bias, where we don't challenge them because we, we believe that they must know what they're talking about because they're the ones training us and not the other way around. An example of how a knowledge-based mistake can arise in the field of physical intervention is when too much reliance is put on a member of staff who may be an ex-police officer or an ex-prison officer, and who the organisation presumes knows about physical restraint simply because of the fact they were once employed in those fields. And I can give you a prime example here. Uh, we had a guy come on a course with us years ago. He left, left the army. He was employed as a hospital security officer. They were looking to promote him um, up to manager level. And they said, look, you've got to go and do this. You've got to go in and you know, restrain people in the accident and emergency department. So you need to do that. And he said, well, when do I get the training? And they said, what do you need the training for? You were in the army. He said, I drove tanks. He said, if we didn't do any of this stuff, you know, I drove tanks. They said, oh, yeah, but look, you're in the army. You must know what you're talking about. They expected him to know. Uh, and in fair play to this guy, he actually paid out of his own pocket to come on a training course to find out. Otherwise, he could have been put in a position with a lot of pressure on him where he'd have had to make up 
a rule and provide some, some information based upon his, in, in this case, limited knowledge of the subject that he was expected to know about because he'd been in the army. Does this make sense to you? It's mad, isn't it, really? As a result, as you can see, they're given the responsibility in some instances without even any further training. And an example is what you're doing now, risk assessments. You know, people are told to go and do risk assessments and they don't get given any training whatsoever. They're expected to know what they do because they're a manager or they're a senior nurse or they're a, a, a whatever, you know. And that's a, a, a prime example where you get a knowledge-based mistake. So well done for being on this course, by the way. Okay, now let's look at violations. And violations are different than what we just talked about. And you'll see how we'll categorize these later on. Now, violations are any deliberate deviation from the rules, the procedures, and the instructions, etc. Most violations are motivated by a desire to carry out the job, despite the prevailing constraints, goals, and expectations. Very rarely are they willful acts of sabotage and vandalism. You know, and I, I'll, I'll give you some examples of these, because there's three categories. You've got routine violation. That's when breaking the rules has become the normal way of working within the group. Now, this can be due to the desire to cut corners to save time, the perception that the rules are too restrictive, lack of enforcement of the rule, and uh, new workers starting a, a, a job where routine violations are the norm. You know, that's accepting them as a standard. Now, I, I experienced this. I spent uh, you know, 12 years in the armed forces. I came out, I did a various other, a couple of other jobs. I ended up in the prison service. I went away, I did the training. It was great, by the way. Thoroughly enjoyed the training. Went to my first prison and they said, how was the training? I said, it was great. And they said, well, forget all that. This is how we do it here. So they were actually predisposing me to a routine violation environment or to an environment where I'm likely to make routine violations. And, you know, I was old enough to challenge that, you know, but that's a, a prime example, you know, of routine violation. You've also got here situational violations. Now, these, these occur when breaking the rule is due to pressures from the job, such as lack of proper staffing levels, inadequate prevention, of, uh, prevention equipment, and fear of discipline. So I can give you an example here from a retail environment. I've done a lot of training with retailers in the past. And they know they shouldn't chase the thief down the road, but they chase the thief down the road because there is an expectation from the management that that's what they're expected to do. So they have the training. It says that if the thief leaves the shop, don't chase them, but they end up chasing the thief. Uh, we've got you know, this issue here of a lack of proper staffing levels. I've dealt with numerous things like this where staff have gone to restrain patients in many cases on their own, which has resulted in them being seriously injured. I mean, in one case, we had a patient that was head banging a wall and staff on their own trying to protect the patient, put their fingers between the patient's head and the wall and end up with broken fingers. But that, because there wasn't proper staffing levels there, they felt they had to do something. And this is where you get techniques come out like breakaway, te um, sorry, basket hole techniques or wraps, as you want to call them, you know, single person techniques. You know, and they, they do this stuff because there's not the proper staffing levels there. And then you've got exceptional violations. Now, this, these happen when thing, something has gone really wrong. Then to solve a problem, staff feel they need to break the rule, even though they're aware they're taking a risk. For example, they, you know, they're using physical force to restrain someone armed with a knife or other form of a weapon or you know, chasing a shop thief down, down the road who's left the store. You know, I get this a lot, again, particularly with South Farm as an example. You know, they staff will actually. I get lots of questions, I get emails saying, you know, how do we restrain someone that's self harming themselves with a sharp implement? And I always go back to the question, you know, what's the risk assessment say? Have staff had training in self harm awareness? You know, uh, what are they going to do with regards to the fact that the person is armed with a sharp implement? They might not want you to take that off them, therefore, that becomes another risk factor. What about cross contamination of bodily fluids? You know, are staff up to date with their jabs, etc.? You know, some of the stuff we covered, covered here on Eric PD. You can see here where you know, staff may violate the rules because there's this expectation on them. So that's the model, okay? That's HSG 48. It's a great model. Rewatch this presentation. I urge you to rewatch this presentation. I mean, like I said, I use this a lot. But just to finish this off, there's two levels here. You can see I've divided this into two parts. The top bit, the errors, they're normally unintentional. Okay, they're not done with any malice whatsoever. But you know, where rule-based mistakes and uh, knowledge-based mistakes occur, it's normally because the company hasn't provided adequate training and supervision. You know, skill-based errors will occur because the company is not providing adequate supervision, as it needs to do under the Health and Safety Work Act, Section 2, brackets 2, brackets C. So although they're unintentional by staff, the staff get blamed when actually in many cases it's the organisation that's not done what they need to do and have left staff in that position. Violations, however, they're intentional. You know, people are taking risks because they believe they have to. They're breaking the rules. They're in some cases, taking extreme risks.
because they believe there's no other option or that's what's expected of them because it goes with the territory, territory, it's part of the job. I hope that model helps. Please do use it, okay? When you do your risk assessments, take the time to do your risk assessment. You know, look into these factors as well as just the sort of the one-dimensional view of the risk. You know, look at the human factor element as well. Thank you so much. Speak to you all soon.